Hello, and welcome to today's NEASC Forum, Why Teach? I'm so happy to be with you all today, today on International Women's Day. Uh, my name is Kelly Christian. I'm our Director for Strategy and Membership here at NEASC. I'm joined with my colleague, Trillian Hilden, and she will be moderating today's session. We also have a special guest, Todd Shai, who's the head of the upper division of Avenues of the World School. Todd has just authored a new book called Teaching Life. It has been described as an eloquent love letter to teaching and to life. And that's exactly why we're all joined together this morning for the next hour uh, to hear from practitioners about what inspired them, what got them into teaching, and why they're teachers still today. We're so pleased to have this group with us representing a wide spectrum of schools and backgrounds. They're here to share their lived experience as educators with you. We'll hear from them soon, but for now, Trillium, I'll hand things over to you to get started. Thank you, Kelly. Well, I am very excited to introduce Todd Shai to you. Um, Kelly's done a little introduction, but I'd like to tell you a little bit more about him. He's gonna speak to us first for a few minutes before we kick off the panel conversation. So Todd has taught for two and a half decades in North Carolina, San Francisco, and New York City. His essays and book reviews have appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle, the Raleigh News and Observer, and the Harvard Divinity Bulletin, Salagundi, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, Todd, and other publications. He has been a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Balakin Citation for Excellence in Reviewing, and as Kelly mentioned, Todd is currently the upper school, upper division um, head at Avenues in New York City. And we are very excited to hear more about his thinking and his recent book, Teaching Life, a book to lift up the teaching profession and to inspire us all. I'm gonna hand it off to Todd now, thank you. Thank you so much, Trillium. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for the invitation. Um, and thanks to my friend and colleague, Tim Carr for connecting us. Um, it's great to be here. I know with so much uh, going on in the world, people are probably coming into this space uh, in all kinds of different ways. I hope you all are well and taking care of yourselves and the people you love. Um, but I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk about teaching. Uh, the topic this morning, why teach, is why I sat down to write a book. I think it was six or seven years ago uh, when I sat down to start um, a book that I think if I had to do it all over again, I might uh, title The Romance of Teaching. Um, a, a colleague told me this week, uh, and it was it was the nicest compliment I've received. He said, your, your book is kind of a prayer for teaching, uh, which I think I'll steal for something uh, later. A prayer for teaching feels really appropriate right now. I was, um, as Trillium uh, said, I was a classroom teacher myself for over 20 years before I moved into my current role. And when I used to tell people what I did, the responses were, uh, became really predictable and a lot of the time were discouraging. Um, there was sometimes a, a kind of a shudder. I don't know if any of you all have re received this. I would tell someone I was a teacher and the response would be, oh, I could never do that. Uh, and there was even more often a strange and unconvincing attempt at respect that felt like a thank you for your service. In other words, it felt to me like thanks for doing what I would never want to do, but I know needs to be done. Thanks for taking one for the team. The award-winning memoirist, Frank McCourt, who was a classroom teacher for a long time before his book, Angela's Ashes, made him famous, reflected on the state of his former job and called it the downstairs maid of professions. My heart sank reading another prominent book in recent years in which the narrator describing a stuck point in his life said, I was a teacher. What could be worse than that? Telling someone you're a teacher should elicit the same kind of response as if you announced that you worked for Doctors Without Borders, but it does not. And this is one of the reasons the teaching profession needs shoring up, needs fortifying, pandemic or no pandemic, the profession itself, the meaning of being a teacher, not the craft of teaching, the experience of teaching not the knowing how to teach, but the being of a teacher, underappreciated. And it seemed to me we had plenty of handbooks, plenty of policy books, 
plenty of studies about how we should structure the educational experience. We had enough books about teaching and learning. What we didn't have were enough books celebrating what it is to be a teacher. We had too much how-to and not enough why do. We were all pedagogy and research and not enough storytelling and song. We were too much prose and not enough poetry. If you're an outsider and you wanted to learn about being a teacher or what it's like to be a teacher and you picked up most books targeting teachers, you would think it's all about technique. You would wonder if there was even a role for imagination and artistry. And so it seemed to me then, and it seems to me now, we need to balance our talk about education with a lot more talk about teachers. We need more portraits that hold up the experience of school and not just arguments about the purpose of it. Reading books about teaching should not feel like opening instruction manuals or unfolding blueprints. Books about teaching should be full of epiphanies and awakenings and stories thick with real life. Because as every teacher knows, to be a teacher is to be surrounded by so much life, almost too much life. Teachers spend their whole lives observing coming of age all around them every day, coming of age. The most profound transformation of an individual life from a toddling, dependent, concrete thinking child to autonomous, imaginative, unique, young adult and then adult. We're around that, we're around coming of age. We're witnesses of it and we're catalysts of it. And it's an awesome responsibility and privilege. And when you open a book about being a teacher, you should glimpse and feel it celebrated and named. And instead too many books about school feel almost lifeless like manuals. And it's the distance from reading an atlas to taking a road trip. Teaching is a road trip with student after student after student and books about teaching are too much like maps. And maybe especially these days when there is an Oklahoma land rush away from the profession, which sometimes being called the great resignation, it is urgent that we figure out how to ennoble this work so that creative, big-minded, full-hearted people want against the odds to teach. And if someone on the brink of their career asks us the question that we're asking ourselves today, why teach? We simply cannot hand them manuals about technique. And what we might hand them instead are stories about what people say about their formative teachers. This is the low hanging fruit to me. We don't do this enough. We should listen to the stories of formative teachers and maybe even do a little reverse engineering from what those stories say. I collect teacher stories, both from real people I meet and stories from more famous people uh, that I read. And I thought I'd share a few of those today. So here's one example uh, from the actor, Patrick. Uh, Stewart, a Shakespearean actor, also a Star Trek uh, a celebrity, uh, Patrick Stewart talking about his teacher, Cecil Dormand. And he encountered this teacher because he decided to not go in a certain direction and instead stayed in this other direction. Uh, and so he begins by saying, uh, had I sat that test to go in this other direction, which he didn't, had I sat that test, I might never have met Cecil Dormand, a teacher at the secondary modern where I ended up who would change my life when I was 12 by putting Shakespeare into my hands for the first time. And I pause to note that language to change my life when I was 12. Stuart goes on, it was the merchant of Venice. He gave copies to most of us and told us to look up act four, scene one, the famous trial scene I was to learn. The first words, I have possessed your grace of what I purpose was the first line of Shakespeare I ever read. I barely understood a word, but I loved the feel of the words and sounds in my mouth. A 400 year old writer reached out a hand in invitation to me that morning. And I felt the sense of an internal private me being released and connecting with something mysterious, alien and exciting. I was hooked. 
Stuart goes on because he's writing at the passing of his teacher. Cease passed away a few weeks ago. He was at the age of 96. He saved my life when I was a boy and my education was failing and has without doubt been the most significant person in my life. If I had not met Cease, what would have happened to me? I am so grateful for his belief in me. Rest in peace, sir. Here's another from the writer Albert Camus. Uh, Camus had just been awarded a, a small little honor, the Nobel Prize. Uh, and his first thought he said was of his mother and his second was a teacher. Having received the most prestigious award a writer can win, the fact that he took up his pen then to write his childhood teacher moves me as much as what he says to his teacher, which also moves me every time I read it. Camus is at the absolute pinnacle of professional accomplishment and respect, and his mind goes back to a teacher who paid attention to him and valued him and connected with him when he was too small to know what a Nobel Prize even was. Dear Monsieur Germain, he writes, I let the commotion around me these days subside a bit before speaking to you from the bottom of my heart. I have just been given far too great an honor, one I neither sought nor solicited. But when I heard the news, my first thought after my mother was of you. Without you, without the affectionate hand you extended to the small poor child that I was, without your teaching and example, none of all this would have happened. I don't make too much of this sort of honor, but at least it gives me the opportunity to tell you what you have been and still are for me, and to assure you that your efforts, your work, and the generous heart you put into it still live in one of your little schoolboys, who despite the years has never stopped being your grateful pupil. I embrace you with all my heart, Albert Camus. This sense that people tell over and over of their formative teachers is of being seen and being recognized, and then also pushed towards something they weren't aware of. Great teachers see kids, they relentlessly pay attention. They claim kids and see them as interesting. They are not bored by them. They are moved by them. Patrick Stewart said, I'm so grateful for his belief in me. Camus, Camus used the language of generosity. Do we pay attention to that? Do we pay attention to what people tell us made the difference in their school life? This seeing and claiming and really loving is everywhere in people's stories about their formative teachers, but it is not everywhere in books about teaching. And it is barely anywhere in books about teaching. And it does not have the place in our professional development that it might and that it should. And I think we just assume it will be there regardless of what we focus on collectively. And so we're not intentional about nurturing it. The things people say change their life. Patrick Stewart said he saved me when I was a boy. We should begin every new school year reading accounts of what people say about the teachers who changed them, this portraiture of what being a teacher is. It's what I tried to capture warts and all, and there are plenty of warts in my own uh, little book about the teaching life. So the final thing I'd say about what it is that uh, teachers do that is so transformative and that makes this work as meaningful and valuable and even magical as any work a person could give themselves to is that the great teachers marvel at the awakening of a student, the awakening itself. I wrote about Tolstoy in my book. Leo Tolstoy was a pretty good writer. Uh, he was also, it turns out, a pretty good teacher. What I love about Tolstoy, the teacher, is the way he pays attention to how his students are coming to life. Their epiphanies delight him. He described one student one time who misused the word hasten in a piece of writing. And Tolstoy said, you know, most teachers would rush to point out the grammatical error the student made. Tolstoy noticed it. 
that most people would rush to correct him. Tolstoy said, we teachers are sometimes like bad sculptors, shaving a little bit off over here, then realizing we have the balance a little off, so we chisel a little off over here, and then we see that the balance isn't quite right, so we keep trimming back and forth, so focused on mistake, endlessly correcting our imperfect students, and instead confronted with the student who misused Hasten. Tolstoy, one of the greatest writers who ever lived, said how charming this was, this student's misuse of a verb, how charming it was, how delightful the way the student's mind was working here, which is what he was observing. Tolstoy's capacity for delight, for being charmed, overruling the impulse here of deficit repair is a quality the best teachers have and very carefully indulge. Watching another young student at 10 or 11 years old struggling with his writing and then finally having a breakthrough, Tolstoy said, when I saw this awakening to the power of poetry, I felt I was seeing something no one has a right to see. And how marvelous that is too. I watched this young student struggling, said Tolstoy, and then awakened to something. And it was so wonderful and so profound. What human has a right to see that happening in another? And it is the answer to the question, why teach, I think. You get to witness that over and over. We should tell Tolstoy's teacher stories and we should listen to the stories that people tell about their own formative teachers. And we should value what is there and build schools around it and write books about it. Our students need to be inspired as well as instructed, but our teachers need to be inspired themselves in order to be inspirers of young people. And so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll finish my uh, portion with just the question of uh, how are we doing this for ourselves and each other? How are we nourishing teachers to feel inspired about the impossibly hard and unforgivably underappreciated and unsung work uh, that they do? Um, I tried to sing the work uh, in my own book, and I appreciate uh, that this morning, this forum, we're, we're trying to do that together. So I, I think I'll pass the floor back to Trillium to introduce uh, a, a panel of great teachers to talk about this work. Thank you so much, Todd, for those inspiring words. Um, you can see in the chat that everyone is um, feeling that. And I don't know if you all felt some emotional pangs that came with those stories. Um, it's a great way to start us off. And we do have a great panel of educators with us today. And I'm gonna ask them to each um, introduce themselves and kick us off with a little uh, a thought or two about why you teach and how you got into teaching and how long ago that was. Um, so if uh, you don't mind, Dominique, would you start for us, please? And then we'll go to Yosat. Absolutely. Um, good morning, everyone. I am Dominique Blue, a learning support teacher at the International School of Beijing, which is a pre-K through 12 American curriculum school serving about 1700 students. This is my eighth year as a teacher. And I got into teaching really as an act of advocacy for my son with special needs. Thank you. And go ahead. Hello everyone, my name is Josep Coelho and I work at Punta Cana International School in the Dominican Republic. Um, I started working in the educational field around 31 years ago and I was actually just like new out of school and I wanted a job where I can, you know, go to college and also get, you know, get some money. But then I found out that that was actually my passion. I, I, I loved, you know, connecting with my students. That was what actually made me wake up every morning and, and, and do what I do. So after going to college and being there for, and actually graduating um, about tourism and hotel management, I decided to start a studying education 
And that's how I ended up where I am. So I've been um, working as a school leader for around 15 years now. Thank you. Andy, could I go to you next? And then Jessica, and then Lisa. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Andy um, Lindblad. I'm a science teacher at the Cotting School in Lexington, Massachusetts. We're uh, a school for uh, students age three uh, up until age 22. Um, with special needs. Um, I've been teaching for about 16 years. I've taught special ed, I've taught Montessori. Um, I got in to special ed 16 years ago um, because I wanted to try something different. And I figured I would try that for a little while and ended up sort of falling in love with it um, and sort of have been around education ever since. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jessica Delaquilla. I'm history teacher at the Jeremiah E. Burke High School, which is in Dorchester, Massachusetts. Um, this is my fourth year as a teacher. And I teach because young people are the future and um, teachers are literally helping to shape the future. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Leahy. I am a high school English teacher in North Providence, Rhode Island in the United States. I am currently in my 22nd year of teaching. My entire career has been here in this high school. Um, I come from a family of teachers, so it's been in my blood. My grandmother was an elementary school teacher. My mother was an elementary school teacher and then became a secondary reading specialist. My father was a middle school history teacher and then became a school principal. Um, my parents both had more than 35 years of education each. Um, I've been a voracious reader. I've always loved stories. I'm a crazy reader now. I'm a film buff. So my day to day is talking about stories with my students and hearing theirs and helping them figure out what kind of stories are out there in the world. Thank you. And Todd is joining our, our panel also as a practitioner. Todd, is there anything else you'd like to say about why you personally got into teaching? No, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those that, that kind of came in through the side door and didn't uh, initially have a big vision for teaching. And it was when I got into it that my, my vision for it formed. Um, so I was working with students in a part-time role while I was in grad school and, and found myself more nourished by that than what I was studying. So I stayed on that path. Um, and, and, and a vision for what the, the, this work has evolved as I did that. That's great. Thanks. Well, what I'd like to ask you all next um, is to think about a powerful moment in your own teaching. Maybe it's an individual interaction with one student or one student who has really touched your life, your life um, or, or just a lesson that lit you up, you know, at the end of that day, like that was why I do this. Um, so could, could any, would any of you like to volunteer to share one of those stories with us? Feel free to unmute or raise your hand. Okay, Andy, I think I saw your hand. And then Yosette. Um, so I, I started a cutting as a classroom teacher uh, for four years, and then we started a pull-out science program. Um, and I started as a science teacher. And I have this board in my room uh, that I put up the first year because I have a habit of being easily distracted. Um, and especially when students have questions that don't necessarily have to do with the subject matter that we're, we're sort of learning about. Um, it had started sort of lighthearted. A student asked me if, uh, if I could confirm or deny the existence of obese dinosaurs. Um, and rather than get into that for, for an hour, which I really wanted to do, uh, we take those questions, we put them on the board and we answer them uh, in the final lesson before a vacation. Um, and I had this moment about six months into doing this where a student came in and said, hey, I'm having brain surgery in three weeks. Can we cover anesthesia? Um, and it was this moment for me of, of realization really where my students connect with my subject material in a very different way than I do. Um, for me, science is something, I mean, I'm passionate about it. I love to teach it. It's been, uh, it's been just a joy to do it. For my students, science has saved their lives multiple times over. Science is what allows them to walk. Science is what allows them to communicate. And for them, in a way that it wasn't for me, it was so deeply personal, um, which, which was really, really sort of eye-opening for me. We have a lovely mix. I mean, we still do it. We have a lovely mix of the sort of deeply personal and the more lighthearted. 
um, as we sort of move through. But that was that was definitely a moment that stands out to me uh, in terms of, of sort of highlighting just just how differently my students are connecting with my subject matter. That's a great story, Andy. Thank you. Are you set? Yeah. Um, when I was a first grade teacher, um, I remember that I will pride myself because my students were they would be doing pretty good, good, like they will be the best readers in the school, you know, um, like I, I will be so proud of them with all their accomplishments for being first graders. But I remember having for the first time, like being um, a first grade teacher for around four years, it was the first time that I had a student that I couldn't reach out. There was nothing that I would do to make him actually grasp what I was teaching him. So I was, I don't know what's wrong with me. So that was the first time that I have to realize maybe it's me, maybe it's something that I'm not doing for him. So then I went to these, um, I went back to school and I started um, doing this um, specialization in difficulties in learning to see and find out what I can do for him. So I remember then meeting with the parents and saying, listen, this is what I'm doing and I'm trying all this in, in this child. And actually they went to run him with tests and actually he had some learning difficulties that I, I was able to identify when he was in first grade. So I think that was a moment that really changed my life because first of all, I have to even internalize and reflect on what am I doing? What can I do better, you know, in this, in, in teaching? Yeah, you didn't yeah. give up on him, which is, just, yeah. I think, the most important part I of the story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is, there, is there one other story? I, I know you probably all have stories, but we'll keep moving. Dominique, yes. <laughs> yes, um, thank you. Um, one of my most powerful teaching moments was when I served as a middle school science teacher and intentionally watering that good trouble spirit of which John Lewis spoke about and later hearing how my students really blossom during the so-called summer of racial reckoning that many of us experience in our schools. So just hearing that positive message of the students were really vocal about the work that we need to be doing and knowing that those seeds that I planted that they got it. They got it. Yeah, I think planting seeds is kind of what we're all about, right? And you never, you don't always see the result of that, but that's that's great, Dominique. Um, I'm gonna ask maybe some of you that didn't answer that question, like Jessica and Lisa, about um, is there anyone in your teaching life who has inspired your teaching? Another teacher or a teacher that you had that you model yourself after? Um, Lisa, I see you shaking your head. Would you like to share? Absolutely. Um, you know, as an English teacher, I have to credit my my English teachers coming up through school. My my seventh grade English teacher, Mrs. David, was the person who taught me grammar and how to diagram sentences. And I still use her lesson about prepositions today. My high school English teachers, um, Mrs. Palazzo, um, Mrs. Tanner and Ms. Lorenzo, um, especially Ms. Lorenzo, who was my senior English teacher, on whom I base almost everything I do. I've stolen so many of her texts because they absolutely excited me and engaged me. She walked into class one day and started speaking another language as far as we were concerned. And she was speaking old English and she was prepping us for a lesson in Beowulf and she was reciting what turned out to be the Lord's Prayer. But instead of coming in and saying, okay, we're going to do Beowulf and here's what we're going to do. She just came in and just started speaking. And um, to this day, I still wish that I could do it. I should, could put in the time and learn it myself. But I, I kind of love this idea that she is still this level that I'm still trying to reach. Um, and if I could get one more in, uh, Dr. Mark Estrin at Rhode Island College was my very first English professor. And he was the kind of professor who would talk and he would explain, these are the things that we're talking about and this is the topic. And one day I rose my hand and I said, hey, you know, I, I don't really agree. I think it's something different. And he said, fantastic, tell me why. And that opened for me the idea that whatever I thought, it was valid. And I always tell my students, you know, two plus two is five as long as you can prove it. 
And so I have been very fortunate to have incredible English teachers on whom I base everything that I do. That made me remember Mr. Smith, my English teacher. So thank you, Lisa, for that. Uh, Jessica. Um, someone that definitely inspires me in, in my teaching is my mentor teacher. And I still call her my mentor teacher, even though she is no longer my mentor teacher because I'm no longer a student teacher. Um, we're now colleagues. I was um, lucky enough to get a job at the school where I did my student teaching. Um, but I say that because um, when I first started at my school, I was actually a long-term sub. Um, and I had previously been teaching abroad um, in Madrid at an elementary school. So then when I was long-term subbing for my, who became my mentor teacher, it was 12th grade. Um, it was my first time teaching a high school class ever. Um, and I would call her and text her like nonstop. Um, and then in fact, I talked to her about this now because we're very close friends. Her husband told her to stop answering me. She was out on maternity leave and I was her long-term sub. Um, and I think I was kind of driving her crazy, but she took the time to give me um, advice, coaching, mentoring, encouragement. Um, and she still does that. I will still go to her. Now I have my own student teacher and I'll often go to my um, mentor teacher and ask her for advice in me now being a mentor teacher. And she just, she, she's, she's the kind of teacher that I definitely um, aspire to be. Um, and then thinking about my own teachers I had an English teacher in high school who was extremely formative for me. And coincidentally, the last me ask webinar that I was on, this was a couple months ago. I got an email from her afterwards. She said, Jessica, I saw you on the, the webinar. I'm so proud of you. And that was kind of a weird, like full circle thing. And we were able to um, chat a little bit and I was able to tell her you had an extremely impactful um like role in, in, in my own teaching. So thank you. And so it was just kind of like a heartwarming thing for both of us. That's great. Thank you so much. I want to ask you all, um, about how you personally have, um, stuck with teaching and persevered in the face of difficulties. Um, we know there's been an, extre an extreme amount of pressure on, on the teaching profession over the last few years. Not that it wasn't stressful before that, um, but how do you, how have you maintained your positive spirit and, and motivation to continue in this, in this career path? Would anyone like to start or shall I pick someone? Lisa? So when we were locked down and put into full distance learning, uh, one of the things I focused on with my students and for myself was just the idea of play. Um, I found this wonderful um, attendance form on Twitter, and I still kick myself to this day, almost three years later, that I forgot to write down the individual's name who actually created it. Um, but it was a wonderful form where instead of just a name and, you know, what period it was the name, it was the period, but then it was a bunch of baby Yoda pictures saying, you know, here's how I'm feeling. I'm happy. I'm surprised. I'm sad. I'm having a tough day. And then there were questions and I've sort of made my own, like, what can I do to help make your day easier? And what are some things that you'd like me to know about? Um, and so I always respond back to those, especially when we're on distance learning for a quarantine or whatever. Um, but even reaching out for, you know, a student telling me he's having pancakes, I was like, oh, you need to send some of those to me, you know, just sort of connecting with them. They know that I'm reading those responses and then working game days into the, the week when we were all at home, you know, I have some trivia games, I have some word games. And so I'm the English teacher. I'm going to play some word games with you. I'm going to have you create gibberish words and create your own definitions. And it was just a way to keep that community because we weren't necessarily able to do it face to face. And so when a student is sitting at home in their room, uh, typically on their phone, you know, waiting to speak their turn or whatever, you know, it engaged them enough to turn on their camera to play with each other, even though we were playing virtually. Um, and it just kept our spirits up, you know, they might be struggling, they might be having a hard time balancing their workload. 
but I tried as much as I could to make my class at least once a week or so a place where we could just sort of cut loose and relax a little bit. I pretended that I was on Twitch. I'd tell them, you know, welcome to my channel. Please remember to subscribe. You know, just goofy little things like that helped make it feel like a class community. Yeah, I love the high school teachers talking to us about play. That's fabulous. <laughs> um, anyone else like to share what, what has gotten you through difficult times in teaching? Jessica? Um, something for me that has helped me persevere and also that continues to keep me in the profession is that my school gives teachers leadership roles. Um, it's definitely super easy to feel like you have no power over anything um, as a teacher and that you're kind of on this island by yourself in your classroom. But my school does a really good job of giving teachers um, a say. And so for me, that was really powerful. And it helped me persevere through the pandemic where we didn't have a lot of control over what was happening. But I did feel empowered to kind of shape the um, the direction that my school was going in and, and shape what work we were doing. So I would definitely say that more schools should do that. Yoset, maybe I'll pick on you a little bit because you are also an acting administrator um, as an assistant um, director of the school. So how do you help your, your other teacher colleagues persevere in, in the face? I know your school has had, I, I did a visit to her school recently and heard about some of the challenges that they've had. How did you, how did you get people through that? Um, yeah, totally. It, it's very different um, from being a teacher, you know, being an administrator and actually be the one who had to inspire the teachers to keep on going on those um, very hard and uncertain moments that we were going through. Um, it was so difficult in the sense that technology here in the Dominican Republic um, our internet is not that good as well. So we had a lot of challenges that maybe other countries they don't have. But in our case, it was more to uh, take into account their well being. And even though we were not in our best moment economically, because everybody was affected in that sense, especially because um, we live in a very touristic area. Um, we thought that it was important to cover some of their needs, you know, to give them a raise, make sure that um, they were aware that their job was secure, you know, like being there for them and also providing the resources that they might need, like um, apps or, you know, um, those type of things that they will need for, for their lessons. So um, that's basically, you know, and also being there for them 24 seven. <laughs> it was a 24 seven job. <laughs> yeah, you're thinking about the students and about all of your staff, of course, at the same time. Yeah, we think about, you know, the challenges that teachers face, um, typically, but also, especially over the last few years. Um, what do you think as educators, teachers need to stay in the profession that they may not be getting um, now, you know, what would help people stay in the profession and how can we um, encourage very, you know, bright and um, wonderful people to get into the profession? Well, I will say that this is a work of passion. You know, being a teacher is something that comes naturally or not naturally, but it's something that you have to have that um, internal uh, drive to, to be a teacher because it's not like we don't do this because of the money, definitely, for sure. Um, so I will say that having all these stories and a uh, satisfaction that we have as teacher, not other, any other profession in the world will provide you that satisfaction of seeing a kid, you know, learning to read or going to college and do what they wanted to be when they were um, an adult, going to the college that they were wishing for. So transforming those lives, that's what actually motivates us to, to be in this profession. Yeah. Dominique, it looked like you also wanted to answer that question. What can we do to keep people in the profession and, and joining us? 
I would say one of the first and foremost things that can be done is to create, you know, communities and environments that are physically and psychologically safe for teachers, for students, that's primary. And then from there, paying teachers their worth. I mean, those are the two things. I need to be safe in my environment and I need to be paid my worth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Yeah, Jessica. Um, I completely agree with Dominique. Teachers need to be paid as professionals because we are professionals. At my school, a huge portion of the teachers have master's degrees. Um, we have teachers who went to Boston University, Boston College, Penn State, UPenn, MIT. Um, there are people in the building here, teachers included, that have PhDs. Um, if that is the if that's the bar that you want for teachers, you have to pay them um, in, in an equivalent amount of money that other people in other professions who have master's degrees and PhDs um, are making. And, you know, I know that a lot of teachers say, like, we're not in this for the money, but I think that that can sometimes reinforce this idea that teachers don't deserve to um, make the amount of money that their professional degree um, would earn them in other professions. Um, so pay them more, respect them. I mean, we, I hear a lot about education in the media, um, particularly during the pandemic. It was kind of like the beginning of the pandemic, teachers are angels. Towards the end of the pandemic, it was like, what's wrong with teachers? What's wrong with unions? Um, or I, I, could, I could do this job, it's just babysitting. Um, if we as a society want um, the best and the brightest to stay in teaching, then that's how we need to talk about teachers um, in the news and in the media. Um, if you disrespect a profession, then teachers are going to leave it because they feel disrespected. Um, so pay them, respect them, and support them. Teachers, especially early career teachers, they need training. I mean, it's not, I mean, I did a one-year grad program at, um, at Boston University, and that isn't enough um, to be a really good teacher. Like, teaching is a craft. It's, it's complicated. It's nuanced. Um, and so we need to continue to offer teachers coaching and um, instruction and mentorship. Um, and also, we need more teachers of color. I teach at a school that is um, the majority of students are Black and Latino. And kind of going along with that, um, if, if that is a goal that we have as a teaching profession, we need to be doing more, um, offer, offer better scholarships, offer better training, offer, um, offer to pay for, for teachers to get their licenses if that's what we if that's what, that's what the students need. And so pay them, respect them, support them. Yes, I think you're getting, you are all getting a lot of, um, yes, we agree in the chat as well from our community of educators that are here with us today. Um, and teaching is a work of art as, as just said in the chat too. Um, we, and we deserve, we deserve the respect and support as you've mentioned. Um, I'm curious about how you see the teaching profession changing over your career path. Um, you know, a, a few things come to mind immediately for me, which is um, the, the stronger um, importance or the stronger understanding of the importance of equity work, as Jessica just mentioned in our schools, um, uh, a stronger focus on well being as um, a key component that has come out of the pandemic, um, perhaps technology as you know, being seen in a different light in education. What are some of the ways that you think the profession has changed? And um, do you think that as teachers, we, um, we're getting what we need to adapt to those changes? Andy, I see you shaking your head. I'm gonna call on you if you don't mind. Yeah, no, no not at all. Um, I. My first job in special ed was two years before the iPad came out. Um, and, and so seeing that and how it's changed my field in particular, um, it's made, there's, there's a lot of benefits to it. My students uh, have a lot more access to that technology now than they would have 
15 years ago. Uh, it's a lot less expensive uh, for them, which is great. Uh, if their um, augmentative communication device can be an iPad mini with an app, um, that's, a little, that's a lot easier for them uh, to use than, than something perhaps more complicated or more expensive. Um, the flip side of that, and, and it's one I think uh, has, has really been accelerated certainly by the pandemic is, is we all feel um, much, much, much more connected for better or worse. Um, the, the sort of um, like walls that existed between school and home life, the, the, um, the ability to sort of communicate instantly with everybody at any time, at any point, um, is a lot more prevalent now. I think a lot of my students uh, are seeing it as well. They're a lot more online, certainly, than they were two, uh, two years ago, and that carries its benefits and that carries its costs. Um, I think it's going to take, there are many, many unintended consequences that we're, that we're not going to know about for several years, too. We're going to look back, um, you know, because educational deficits play out over time. Um, so, you know, we're going to look back in five years and 10 10 years of people of a certain age who sort of went through this um, and, and sort of perhaps have a clearer view. Uh, but no, those are sort of the two things I see right now. Technology connects us for better and worse. Um, and it's, it has made uh, for, you know, my students in particular, a lot of things much more accessible. Thanks, Lisa. I think one of the things I've noticed most in my career, um, I started off as a much more traditional teacher. I like to joke that I have one foot in the tradition and one foot in the innovation um, because I was, I was raised by more traditional teachers who would stand in the front of the room and you wrote down everything they said. And uh, as an English teacher, I'm not much of a lecturer, but over the past, I'd say probably 17, 15 years, I've really pushed myself to show my students that I am human. Um, my husband is an improv actor, and when he teaches his 101 courses, he shows everyone that when you mess up, everyone cheers. Um, and so you make a mistake and everyone goes, yay, and then you move on. Um, you know, I teach my students that mistakes are a part of life and mistakes are part of learning. So often I make mistakes and I'll go, Ugh, that didn't work. Let's not do that again. And we move on. Um, technology has come into my classroom in the past 15 years, starting with students' cell phones and, you know, me trying to figure out a way, how can I get this to use, get these students to use this as a tool to help their learning as opposed to being something for distraction. My students don't need me to tell them a definition of a word anymore. They can Google that. So my job is no longer to be the source of information. My job is to be the facilitator for the activities to help my students know what to do with that information. Uh, frequently, somebody will come to my door, whether it's an administrator or a colleague, and they can't find me. And it's because I'm sitting down with my students. I'm working with them in groups. They're exploring their learning. They're doing whatever tasks they're working on. And I don't stand in the front of the room much to talk at them. I'm speaking with them. They're exploring with me. Um, and I, I always tell them, you know, just try to go out on that limb. Don't worry about being right all the time because nobody is right all of the time, except me, I joke. And of course I'm not. Um, but it's fun to get them to try and just to pretend that, you know, if, if you knew the answer to that question, what would your answer be? is something that I picked up in uh, either a webinar or um, an article somewhere, you know, students who say they don't know, the response is, well, if you did know, what would the answer be? And it's interesting to sort of unlock their brains a little bit and just get them to say something, to try something and not worry so much about what is the answer my teacher wants. And so that's something that I see more and more, especially with the advent of technology, because all of the answers, all of the work is available at their fingertips. So how do we work with students to get them to engage with the content, to engage with each other? Because those transferable skills are really what they're going to need as they go outside of high school, to college, to the military, to the job force. It's not, do you know what color shirt a certain character was wearing in a certain chapter? It's, you know, how did that character interact with strangers that he met on the street? What did that character do when he faced an obstacle in life? And this is what they talk about and learn from each other's experiences, especially from the people who have experiences very, very different from them. 
Thank you. Dominique, if you don't mind, I'd like to pick on you a little bit. I know that you have been um, deeply involved in equity work, um, both within your own school and in the international school community. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of, um, you know, how the teaching profession and our schools are changing or not changing um, as you have been deeply embedded in that work? Absolutely. I would say that the awareness has always been around, so it's definitely not something new, but I guess there is a greater awareness or maybe more acknowledgement, but that piece has always been there. But uh, within international schools, I can see there is a shift, however small, there is a shift. Um, but actually being here in China and when I you know, look at the news, there's also the reality that for every step forward that we make, it seems like we're taking two steps back. You know, if we think about the summer of racial reckoning that happened in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd and everything that came about because of that, and then now being hit across the, the face with CRT, CRT, and it's like, I want to say that, hey, there's been this great change over the last two years, but honestly, I don't see that change as being lasting because there are forces out there who don't want us to progress and move forward. And so as educators, we really have to stand our ground. And honestly, we have to start taking a fight to them because there is a fight. And that's just the reality of it. We see it when we turn on the news, we hear it from the school board meetings that something is happening. And the progress that we have seen, there is an element slowly trying to move us back. And so I wish I could be more optimistic. There is change happening, very small, but the reality is that there is a force that doesn't want us to make the progress that we all need as a profession and that our students need as well. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, you know, we're teaching, teaching happens in the context of history happening also. And so, you know, we are, we are in a position as teachers where we can actually change things from within, from within people. Um, and so it's just really interesting to think about how our profession is even changing right in this moment um, with, you know, with what's happening in Europe right now and, and how we might address that as teachers. Um, and obviously the important um, equity work that continues and will have to continue. Um, I'm gonna ask us all to answer, um, go do a round robin, including you, Todd, if you don't mind. Um, uh, we're gonna try to leave this webinar on an inspiring note, even though we know there are many challenges to teaching. And I'd like to ask you what advice you would give to someone who is considering coming into teaching or who is a newer teacher in their first few years. Um, so let's see, who hasn't spoken for a while? Um, Yosette, would you like to start? What, what advice would you give to new teachers? Never give up. <laughs> I know it's 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 I mean it's a demanding job, it's tiring, straining, but it's all worth it. So never give up. You'll see the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Todd, would you like to go next? Sure. And I'll, I'll piggyback what Josette just said, because I was gonna say uh, my advice is it's a long game. It takes a while for, for a new teacher. It takes a while to become good at, at teaching. It takes years. Um, Jessica, I was thinking when you introduced yourself as being in your fourth year, I was thinking that's about when I started to feel like, okay, I can do this. That's a long time. So uh, I, my advice is uh, remember it's a long game. Forgive yourself because of that. Um, and don't worry alone. There, there are people around you. Um, and, but then I, the other thing I would say to new teachers is, um, really pay attention to incidental moments with kids before class, after class, in line, at lunch, before an assembly, on the outside when they're getting picked up to go home. Really pay attention to how you connect with kids when you're not just teaching them and the capital that that builds with them is enormous. Thank you. Jessica? Um, 
just to your point, Todd, I still sometimes I'm like, I don't really know if I have this down yet. Um, so that's why I would say you need to find a mentor, um, whether that's your actual mentor teacher or just a veteran colleague in the school or joining a support, uh, like a teacher support group. I know a lot of um, districts and unions will organize um, new teacher groups or even like classes that new teachers can take. Um, my other piece of advice uh, would be to celebrate the small wins um, and to, to give yourself a break. We're not brain surgeons and even brain surgeons have to take a vacation or take a break sometimes. Um, so give yourself that grace to, to, to know like you're not here to, to, to change everything or to solve all the problems in the world. So focus on your locus of control and celebrate the, the tiny victories. That's great, thanks. Um, Andy, you're on my, next, on my screen next, if you don't mind. Yeah, not at all. Um, advice for new teachers, it's, um, it's fun. What we do is fun, right, at its core. It's, this is a fun job. And so like what I would tell people thinking of getting into it is that there is a great deal of enjoyment to be had. Um, the second thing I'd say, and this is tied into what a lot of the rest of us have said, is that all, all teachers struggle, all of us, every single one, a lot. Um, and, and that the, the, the really competent educators in my life that I've seen stick with it through, um, through their careers and the ones I really admire are, are, are not the ones who are perfect because that teacher doesn't exist, but they're the ones who are able to per persist and grow through the things that don't go well. Um, because there's lots of stuff that doesn't go well sometimes. Um, and so being, being able to sort of learn and grow through that rather than expect perfection of yourself or aspire to the to perfection that does not exist um, is, is, is really, really important. Thank you. Uh, Lisa and then Dominique with the last word. So my advice would be to focus on why you're there. And it usually boils down to two things, your passion for what you're teaching and who you're actually teaching. Um, as I said before, you know, I've always been fascinated with stories and I'm a crazy reader and I'm a crazy movie buff. And that's what I do every single day in my classroom. I talk about what books I'm reading. We talked this weekend about the Batman, you know, like we, we go through everything and we talk about it and we connect it to what we're doing. And it always comes back to who are those individuals sitting in front of me in my classroom? Yes, I have a ton of paperwork I have to do. Yes, I have things the State Department of Ed wants me to get done yesterday. Yes, I have things that I need to do uh, for my department chair, for my administrators and whatever, but I come to school every single day so that I can connect with these individuals who are in front of me. We chat about their lives. We chat about my life. Uh, what are you reading? What are you doing? You know, nothing breaks my heart more than telling a student who's reading a book from outside of school that they have to put away their book and focus on my book. But the fact that they're reading that book makes my heart sing. And it's just this wonderful passion that I get to share with them. And that's what it really comes down to. So when I think about those hard days um, and, you know, Jessica, you're talking about how you're still not sure how you're doing, you know, I'm 22 years into this and there are still days where I feel the imposter syndrome. We all feel it no matter how long we've been here. Um, there's always a point where you're like, Ugh, I'm not sure what I'm doing and I'm not sure this is working. The fact that you're there, the fact that you're showing up and the fact that you're talking with these students as they are in fact human beings and not just a number on your grade book, that proves that it's working. They are showing up for you. They are excited to see you. So keep that in mind and just keep sharing what you do with them. Thank you. Dominique. So my advice to aspiring or new teachers um, is to one, establish boundaries. <laughs> Tell some boundaries for yourself. Number two, Enjoy the challenge. And lastly, number three is to never feel conflicted about protecting your peace. Thank you. Well, I just wanna thank all of our panelists and Todd for an inspiring morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you're calling in from. Um, and thank all of our participants for chiming in with all of their great thoughts and feelings about the teaching profession. Um, we do thank you for your service to your students. And um, we at NEASC are really proud to be affiliated with all of you and your colleagues at your schools. 
So I'm going to pass it back to Kelly, who will close us out here um, from this NIASC forum. Thank you all again so much. I'm feeling very inspired at, and from the dozens and dozens of comments in the chat, I hope all of you panelists are seeing uh, how inspiring your words were today to your fellow teachers. Uh, I encourage you, if, if you joined us synchronously and live today, when the recording's posted, if you were inspired to share this with your colleagues, I wish we could start every morning off this way. Uh, I hope that this gives you a, a lot of strength and support as you move through the week. Uh, so to all of those who are with us live today or watching us in the future, teachers, we appreciate you. Uh, we're so glad at NIAS to, to have you be the daily people that we work with. And um, thank you for everything that you do. And again, we thank you for being a part of this conversation in global community. Thank you to all of our panelists and to our attendees, and we'll see you next month.